Good afternoon. I'm Henry Quillian here at Taylor English Duma with a lot of my colleagues in our litigation department. I'll give a plug for the litigation department. We were received Georgia Litigation Department of the Year by the Daily Report and had our picture this morning taken, which is a big achievement. For those out there in the world, uh, Litigation Fundamentals with Henry Quillian is a reference class that is not to be relied on by anybody uh, with respect to the conclusions we reach and the things we discuss. It's something for you to look at when you're pursuing litigation. If you're a lawyer, for you to consider yourself, go research, find answers, and to rely on your own conclusions. And if you're not a lawyer and somehow are involved with litigation, first you should go hire a lawyer if you can, and if not, uh, you cannot rely on our uh, presentations for legal advice. However, we are here to discuss things that should be helpful for you if you're a client asking your lawyer good questions, if you're a lawyer asking yourself good questions and trying to find answers, and uh, also uh, just to generally help people in the world understand what litigation in the United States is like. So today we're actually taking a little bit of a jump off uh, the series that we were pursuing because uh, we are now going to be discussing motions to dismiss in federal court under the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure and under the precedent set in the appellate courts of the United States, including the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, in an earlier session, we discussed motions to dismiss in Georgia courts in great detail with respect to which rules do you rely upon, what are the basis for those rules, is it a good strategy to move to dismiss, or are you better off not trying to move to dismiss? Uh, where is it going to get you? Is it just going to be a waste of time and money, or is it actually going to have uh, a benefit to your client? Well, we're going to talk about many of those same things with respect to federal court, but one of the principal discussions today is what are the differences in the way a federal court judge analyzes a motion to dismiss, principally under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12b-6, which relates to failure to state a claim, in comparison to, for instance, the Georgia Civil Practice Act, uh, which has a different standard of analysis now. I really should say the federal courts now have a different standard of analysis than the Georgia courts do, whereas historically they were roughly similar. Now, uh, a motion to dismiss is, of course, a preliminary motion that can be pursued by a defendant who has been served with a summons and complaint in a United States District Court. And many clients think when you say, oh, motion to dismiss, of course, they think everything that's ever been, they've ever been sued for has no support whatsoever. It should just be quashed right away and that you ought to win. That's the end of the lawsuit. Uh, we would love to be able to tell them that that is always going to be the case, but usually it is a litigation narrowing situation where you try to get rid of some claims or you try to say this court is not the right one. For instance, under for lack of personal jurisdiction, you got to go somewhere else and hope the case goes away. And there's how many different ways could a motion to dismiss? Uh, what, how many different types of orders could you get in connection with a motion to dismiss? Three. All right, Ms. Weber says three. What type? Full dismissal. Which would be Denied. dismissal with prejudice, 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 which, prejudice. which puts a puts a flash on the entire case forever until it's appealed. Or an order granting the dismissal, but giving the plaintiff the opportunity to amend their complaint. Okay, so there would be a, that's a possibility. Order granting the dismissal without prejudice initially uh -huh. and giving the plaintiff the opportunity to amend the complaint, meaning file a different complaint with more, <coughs> more things in it. Yep. And then what would be a third possibility? Denial. Okay. To, 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 to deny the motion to dismiss and the case continues going forward. Okay, so there could be a denial. And then of course, within all three of those realms, there could be a partial dismissal. For instance, ones, claims 1, th 2, and 3 survive, <coughs> claims 4, 5, and 6 get either dismissed without prejudice, allowing to briefly dismiss with prejudice, or uh, denied. Uh, 
Um, and then also something we're not going to concentrate on, but it, it is interplays heavily, is there's a possibility within the realm of the words motion to dismiss under 12b1, there is the possibility of um, dismissal for lack of jurisdiction, which could include, if you're in federal court, lack of federal question jurisdiction. For instance, the case gets thrown out, somebody sues for a uh, something that's not allowed in federal court, which have, as we'll discuss, limited jurisdiction. Or it could be a situation where they sue the defendant and a federal court somewhere might have jurisdiction, but they sued in the wrong state and the person shouldn't be subject to be having a lawsuit against them in that particular state. So we're not going to concentrate on lack of personal jurisdiction. We're not going to really talk about uh, federal question jurisdiction, except as it relates to some of the standards that would be similar to or the same as how you analyze a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. Now, one thing we are going to talk about because it goes, it's right along the same lines, and it's called a motion to strike uh, in the federal courts, and it's under Rule 12F. Now, the, how many people have received the sample orders that I distributed uh, with the Quillian's Colonel slash Litigation Fundamentals notice. How many received them? Everybody received it, right? How many people read those orders? Oh, a lot of you. I'm so, I, I, I see that every one of you did. That's great. So we'll be able to discuss it in the third one. Well, the reason why I ask that is in the federal courts, particularly in the 11th Circuit, these days, there is a great desire for the courts, the 11th Circuit and the district courts, to have pleadings that are reasonably read, for lack of a better description, by the court. Uh, and there's a strong uh, deterrence against something known as shotgun pleading. And one of the orders I distributed to you is one where Judge Amy Totenberg struck an entire complaint that was filed against our client uh, well, because it was a shotgun pleading. And therefore, since they're absolutely prohibited in the 11th Circuit, which is where Georgia is, you don't want to file a shotgun pleading because at best, uh, you'll get to start over again, and at worst, uh, you, uh, you have your complaint stricken, and you'll waste all the time and money associated with preparing. Now, I'll, just to display this from a distance for the uh, audience and uh, for y'all, this is a chart of the, of the claims that were in this case. Uh, each block, each uh, line in the chart being a different count in the complaint against different defendants or groups of defendants. The, Right, if you're seeing all this right here, that's the list of the defendants that each count is against. And of course, it goes on and on. <laughs> it was uh, 268 pages. Uh, and it's about 20 the plaintiffs against 20 defendants. Uh, that's the sort of general description. 51 counts of complaint. And in each count, there were, I think there were 268 pages of complaint. Each count reincorporated in full every factual allegation and every previous <coughs> account uh, that had been stated in the complaint. So if you got to the last count, essentially you're reincorporating 260 pages of facts and pleadings um, and trying to say that these three defendants that are on that particular account uh, have to respond to uh, their their uh, negligent or intentional misrepresentation is, is associated with all those 262 pages. Well, uh, there's a case called Whelan versus Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office by the 11th Circuit, uh, 792 Fed 3rd, 1313, 11th Circuit, 2015, where that uh, goes through what is a uh, shotgun complaint and says they're barred in the 11th Circuit. And you should never assert it. And so I'll just read what there are four categories of shotgun pleadings. We're not going to go all the way into each, each one, but the most common type is a complaint, 
containing multiple counts where each count adopts the allegations of all preceding counts, causing each successive count to carry all that came before and the last count to be a combination of the entire complaint. This is what I gave you an example of. The most common type is a complaint that is replete with conclusory, vague, and immaterial facts not obviously connected to any particular cause of action. The third type is the one that commits the sin of not separating a, a different count, each cause of action, or claim of relief. So that would be like you'd have one count, it's more like four different causes of action. And the fourth type asserts multiple claims against multiple defendants without specifying which of the defendants are responsible for which act or omissions, or which defendants the claim is brought against. So, in this case, the judge said, too, too bad, you, this, is a, this is a case with too many defendants, you're alleging everything against groups of defendants by groups of plaintiffs that had fraud, alleged in such as that, and the judge said, I'm striking the whole thing in order, in order that it be replayed. And when she ordered that it be replayed, she said, uh, with respect to each count that requires some sort of intent to be pled, you have to plead facts that support the intent of each defendant doing each thing they did. Of course, now we've got a 368-page complaint thank you, uh, to respond to. But uh, <coughs> there's a question uh, whether that's going to meet uh, the standards of the 11th Circuit or the specific directions of the trial judge. Now, uh, so just in general, if it looks like a mess, it's highly likely that the uh, trial judge and the district court will believe it's a mess. Consider making a motion to strike under Rule 12F to get rid of the complaint entirely if you're the defendant. <coughs> I'll note, as uh, Ms. Ferrier could probably tell you, what if you have a motion to dismiss you want to file and a motion to strike, which one do you file first? Motion to strike. The motion to strike. If you look at the rules themselves, it actually says, before the filing of any other response and pleading, file your motion to strike. And the, we interpreted that as you have to file your motion to strike first, even if it's on the same day. So we did motion to strike and then motion dismiss. Now, motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim under Rule 12, uh, 12b-6. Can somebody cite to me the historical, historical standard of review by trial court and a federal district court for determining whether a case, a claim for relief should be dismissed for failure to state a claim? You assume all the facts to be true for, for purposes of assessing the motion to dismiss. Okay, so number one, and that's a fundamental statement that continues, I believe, that, the, that when it's reviewed, the court has to assume all facts that are alleged in the complaint are assumed to be true. And you know, if you're representing a defendant, you know your defendant's going to say, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true. Well, with respect for a motion to dismiss, it doesn't matter. If the plaintiff said it and it's a fact, it's presumed to be true. And what must the court decide in order to get rid of a complaint where they're looking at the facts and they have assumed them all to be true on a motion to dismiss? Huh? Even assuming all the facts is true, it still doesn't state a claim uh, under, uh, under the law. Or under the cause of action as alleged. Okay, so looking at the historical standard, if you look at all those facts and presume them to be true, and you still have to, the court would have to decide back then, uh, do those facts indeed lay out the elements of the claim that the party is seeking relief upon? So, for instance, if you had four elements in your cause of action, there would have to be facts to support each of the four uh, elements. Now, uh, how liberal was the previous standard of a motion to dismiss prior to, let's say, the last 12 years or so? It was very liberal. It was just, did you give the other side reasonable notice of what the claim was? 
okay, it was called notice based pleadings, and it was extremely liberal, which means if it's real liberal and you're the defendant, how easy is it to get a motion to dismiss granted if the plaintiff has done much at all as far as pleading their facts? Very difficult. Very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, and in fact, there was a, a standard that said uh, that dismissal should not be granted unless there is no set of facts that the defendant has given notice of that could be proven by the plaintiff that would result in liability of the defendant. Uh, and that is, that even allows imagination, in a sense, by the trial judges, what facts could the plaintiff possibly prove based on what they told me, and I might infer therefrom, uh, by which they could uh, recover against the defendant. So uh, you could easily get a dismiss, I mean, a denial of a motion to dismiss, right, under that standard. Well, uh, cases came along which are. Uh, which limits, which make it harder for a plaintiff to survive a motion to dismiss in the federal district courts. And uh, can anybody give me what those two cases are from the U.S. Supreme Court? That Twombly. Iqbal and Twombly. Thank goodness they weren't. It wasn't Smith and Jones, right? Because everybody knows what you're talking about when you're talking about Iqbal and Twombly. Now, uh, I need to get my correct pleadings here. Uh, so, what was, and those were uh, at least Iqbal, which I guess is, I believe, is probably the most. It, basically, Twombly decided that in antitrust cases, that the facts that were pled not only had to be. Uh, stated, and they could not simply be stated in a mere conclusory, bare-bones fashion like the defendants or the, plaint the defendants knew what they were doing was wrong or something like that, if there was an intent standard. In the antitrust case, it said they had to actually plead facts, which if deemed to be plausible, would, uh, survive, would, would survive a motion to dismiss. No, I think it's actually the facts are assumed to be true, not plausible. And if you assume the facts to be true, does it support a plausible theory of recovery? In other words, you're not assuming the facts alleged are plausible, you're assuming they're true. Yes, you're assuming facts that are alleged to be true. And does but, that plausibly but, support a claim? And then you also have to determine, however, at least we're going to, we have argued recently, successfully, that conclusions Mere conclusions are not presumed to be true. Correct. And that there have to be facts sufficient to give rise to a plausible relief at the end of the day. Uh, so, uh, and then there was a case, then the big question was for a, number, a bit, a couple of years, uh, does this only apply to antitrust cases? And uh, in this case, called Iqbal, I-Q-B-A-L, came out from the Supreme Court. And that case was one, I think it was a civil rights case where they, uh, where it was alleged that there was a pattern in practice and, and a policy within a police department uh, to do bad things to uh, uh, criminal defendants that had been, that were subject to being arrested. And they just, they didn't have any facts to support what they were claiming was policy and practice and, and uh, wrongful activity. Uh, and so the court held that there had to be facts pled uh, that would support this plausible outcome. Do you think that uh, hits the mark? Yes. Vicky. And uh, we have the benefit today, I might add, of having a privately a hired judge, Mickey Ross, in our, <laughs> in our, uh, <laughs> in our uh, presence because we actually did hire him to uh, vet a motion to dismiss hearing before we went in to moot it for us before we went in and argued it a couple of months ago. So let me just read this from uh, Iqbal because I think it's uh, illustrative. The tenet that a court must accept all the, uh, tr as true all the allegations contained in a complaint 
is inapplicable to legal conclusions. So if you're a defendant and you're analyzing a claim, first thing you do is say, is what they put in there, what the plaintiff put in there, is that merely a legal conclusion or is it actually a fact? Okay? Threadbare recitals of the elements of a cause of action supported by mere conclusory statements do not suffice. So if somebody just says a uh, defendant was negligent and leaves it at that, is that a fact or is that a conclusion? All right, when he says conclusion, okay. Uh, what if they just say uh, plaintiff reasonably relied on the allegate the uh, misrepresentation of the defendant? Fact or conclusion? That's a where, that's a conclusion. In fact, we're going to argue that by Tuesday uh, uh, that that's a conclusion. However, if you look at uh, Rule 9B of the uh, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure that relates to fraud having to be pled with specificity, it actually says that mere states of mind, such as malice or intent, may be generally alleged. And usually the words generally alleged means you can just state that it existed rather than uh, as a conclusion, rather than it actually, you have a fact that actually to prove the person thought that, like a declaration out of their mouth or something. I know I'm defrauding you, or I know I'm wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, okay, reading on in Iqbal, Rule 8 marks a notable and generous departure from hyper-technical code pleading regime of the prior era. So that's referring back to before the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure. So Rule 8 of the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure came in, and rather we had notice pleading rather than what they called uh, fact pleading and demur, demurs. Um, but it does not unlock the doors to discovery for a plaintiff armed with nothing more than conclusions. So within the Iqbal and Twombly realm, what does that tell you all about what the courts are thinking about what's happening with discovery at the federal courts? Perhaps they think discovery is running out of control, people are just making up stuff filing complaints, they don't have any facts and, and uh, to support their claims, and then they're going to get discovery from defendants who never should have to be providing in the first place because there shouldn't be a lawsuit in the first place against the defendant. But this is one that I really like. Uh, there is a context-specific task that requires the reviewing court to draw its judicial experience and common sense, to draw on its judicial experience and common sense. A plaintiff's factual allegations must be enough to rise to the height, to, to raise a right to relief above, above a speculative level. Let me read that again. A plaintiff's factual allegations must be enough to raise a right to relief above a speculative level. That's from the Twombly decision. So if you put those together, uh, you can conclude that when reviewing a complaint, first of all, sort of count the specific facts that are alleged and determine what is actually there with respect to each element of each claim for relief. If there's nothing but a legal conclusion, uh, then in federal court, it might be a suspicious pleading, for lack of a better description, that you might be able to do something with as a defendant in a motion to dismiss. If the facts, if there are apparently facts alleged, if those facts are extremely suspect, uh, then you might consider attacking those facts, telling the judge, hey, you have to use your common sense uh, and uh, judicial experience in determining whether this is just purely a speculative outcome that's being uh, sought by the uh, plan. And in this recent case, this set of cases we have, one of which is on appeal right now, the allegations were that uh, convenience stores uh, were all conspiring nationwide to put uh, labels on particular products and that those labels were incorrect and that therefore it was hurting the plaintiff manufacturer, that they were false labels. But our position was 
Your Honor, when you have an allegation that a single shop owned by a single person in a particular location, which was expressly alleged by the plaintiff, was in this worldwide conspiracy uh, with all these other people that uh, are listed in the complaint and all these ones that aren't listed in the complaint, that that makes no common sense whatsoever, that that's actually something that really happened. Now, that's probably on the outer end of argument with respect to a motion to dismiss, but uh, the court looked at the circumstances and that gave rise to the court asking specific questions of the plaintiff's attorney about, so what do you have to show this? And the attorney couldn't really come up with anything that would be a fact that would support the conclusion that they had uh, alleged in the complaint. So that worked out pretty well. And if you look at the order that I've distributed, the court expressly points that out, that the court got that concession from the plaintiff as part of the oral argument. Uh, so once you've, once you've gone through the <coughs> sifting of the complaint, then you determine, okay, do we still meet the standard uh, of 12b-6, which assumes all facts are true, are there facts alleged? If the facts alleged, do they give rise to a plausible uh, relief that would be obtained by the uh, plaintiff against the defendant? And I might point out that when you're making that determination and you're in federal court, what law do you need to look to? If you're in a particular district and a particular circuit, what law do you need to look at? Well, for purposes of determining whether a claim for relief has been stated. Where would you start looking? Maybe you start looking at the statute that's involved first, right? <laughs> okay. But then you would have, need to look at the circuit. You need to look at Supreme Court cases, see if they give you any uh, very specific guidance on uh, whether the claim for relief has been stated. And you have to look at what does the circuit think about this particular claim for relief that's been asserted and then also if they don't provide clear absolute answers then you need to go to the district court in which your which your case is pending right and so and then if you can't get anything there you have to look to broader more you know, persuasive authority somewhere else because in the particular set of cases we have there's actually differences between the circuits as to exactly how they craft a particular cause of action all of which has been stated the exact same way by the exact same plaintiff in lots of different jurisdictions. Uh, also, when it's, you know, one of the things we talk about here is, is it a good idea to bring a motion to dismiss or is it not a good idea? So it's only if you think you can win after going through a thorough analysis of putting your hands and your, yourself in the shoes of the judge that you should spend the time making the motion to dismiss unless there's some other reason why you ought to do it, such as filing a motion to dismiss and the federal district court stays what? Discovery. Discovery, which could be extremely valuable. Or uh, there might be lots of other practical reasons why you would like want to file a motion to dismiss. But as far as a pure legal analysis, is it worth all the briefing? Is it worth all the time? Uh, consider other possibilities, other things that might come into play. For instance, if you just look every, if you just look everything on the, as if the playing field was equal among all parties, uh, two big corporations suing each other, there might not be a any heartstrings being pulled uh, of the judge for this particular case. But if you have a circumstance where the you're representing a single not well healed defendant against a monster corporation and you believe that the monster corporation is just trying to take advantage of the small not well healed person or entity uh, do you think that might vote better for you in the judge's analysis or worse if the judge is trying to really ferret through a complaint representing the small guy what do you think better, better for you more, very, more than likely. 
Uh, one thing that we came across recently, if you want to try to drive your points home with respect to uh, the reasons for your motion to dismiss and how harmful it is on your client, uh, do you think it'd be a good thing or a bad thing to try to get before the judge in person as opposed to have the judge rule on paper? It's a good thing to get in person. In person, okay. And if you're in the Northern District of Georgia or any other district court, uh, are there any special ways you can get in front of a judge on a motion to dismiss for a hearing that you might not get before a judge otherwise? Young a young litigator. Okay, if you have a young litigator, uh, you might be able to get before a court. Recently, we had one where we had an old litigator who was a young, young in litigation. <laughs> I should say an old lawyer who was young in litigation. He had only been practicing uh, law as an active member of the bar for less than five years, although he had been, he had passed the bar and I guess was officially uh, sanctioned about 20 years ago. But he had just come come out of in-house practice and we had less than five years, so we were able to convince Judge Batten to have a 50-something-year-old lawyer argue as a young lawyer. Uh, and that allowed us to get before Judge Batten in person and make an effective presentation. And that was yet another case where we got a case dismissed uh, using principally the Twombly, Iqbal plausibility analysis, <coughs> as well as the 11th Circuit uh, dictates for this particular cause of action. Now, um, what else could it do for you, even if you don't win the motion to dismiss, but you get before the judge, and the judge has the opportunity to look at the plaintiff's claims on a motion to dismiss, and ultimately rules against you, and you're representing any type of party. What if the judge just expresses some, you know, severe doubts about the viability of the plaintiff's case, even if it survives the motion to dismiss? Is that good if you're the defendant? Yes. Yeah, so good. Maybe you got, got a comment? Invite settlement. Okay, yeah, invite settlement. Uh, possibly get you into mediation mode or just, or just negotiations over settlement. Uh, so, uh, another thing to consider, <coughs> at the same time you're considering a motion to dismiss, pop it for another day, but if it looks like whatever's being, if everything you've been able to assess with respect to the complaint is such that the, you know, as the client, as the representative of the client, and after interviewing all the representatives of the client, that whatever is alleged factually by the plaintiff you know can never be proven by the, by the uh, plaintiff because they just made up things and put them in the complaint as if they were facts even though they didn't, the facts didn't actually exist. You can consider being really aggressive, not done very often, but preparing a Rule 11 motion to serve at the same time you serve your motion to dismiss saying, hey, you got 30 days to cons reconsider whether you want to keep this case pending because uh, if you serve a Rule 11 motion, it doesn't actually uh, start taking effect until 30 days after you serve it. Um, and then you have to file it after that 30 day safe harbor period. Uh, so, in this case, in the case that I distributed to you, which is now dead and gone, which is good, uh, a Judge Boyle in, that, in the Dallas. Uh, let's see, in the district court sitting in Dallas, which I think is the Northern District of Texas, uh, she actually did something very unique at the uh, oral argument, which she called on her own uh, for a motion to dismiss, even though typically all motions are decided on paper. So when she called the motion to dismiss to a hearing, we knew that we were in a good position. We were the defendant. We had filed the motion to dismiss because we knew that she had severe questions about the case. And uh, what happened there was she granted the motion to dismiss from the bench, but told the, and then entered a minute entry on it, uh, and told the defendant, you can replead, and you have 30 days to replead, 
But if you replead, you need to take into special account uh, the sanctions that can be granted against you in the event you plead something that you're not able to sustain. In other words, just to get past the motion to dismiss. Uh, and then she and she told the defendants, you don't even have to respond when they replead. I will decide whether they have replead or not sufficiently. And I'll either give you notice and then you can move to dismiss again or uh, I'll go ahead and dismiss the complaint without the defendants having to do anything. Uh, and so as, we were think as I was thinking about this, what happens to you if you're in the court, let's say you're the plaintiff who's losing a motion to dismiss, what should immediately come to mind if the judge says, your case, your case is dismissed, <coughs> but I'll think about letting you revive it? If you're the plaintiff, you're sitting there in court. Find another jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Hal says find another jurisdiction. It's probably a very wise thing. Dismissed without prejudice. See if you can't take it to state court or something. So. All right. You're going to have a problem doing that because um, if the court has announced from the bench its intention to dismiss, you can't run into court and dismiss without prejudice, even though the court has not yet entered a written yes. order. Mm -hmm. uh, my son, who's an attorney with DeKalb County, just briefed that same issue. I see. Okay, so I think that was wrong. It probably varies from court to court, but there's pretty damn good authority that you can't avoid the inevitable by trying to dismiss without prejudice when you see what's coming down the road. Okay. And uh, what else comes to mind if the court has told you your case, uh, now we're looking from the plaintiff's side now, your case has just been dismissed, but you can replead in 30 days. Settlement. <laughs> okay. Uh, settlement is a possibility. Uh, should you start thinking about when your appeal rights start to run? If the court enters a minute order saying the case is dismissed. That's one of the things that came up in our case is I wonder what the plaintiff is thinking with respect to when they need to file an appeal. The Seventh Circuit recently has issued an order chastising district judges for doing exactly that because it confuses the, the timing for filing your notice of appeal, basically saying courts, if they're going to make an order, they should go ahead and issue the written order, not do a minute entry to be followed by an order. Um, you know, it's an admonition by the Seventh Circuit. It's not obviously binding in the Eleventh Circuit, but it really creates all kinds of traps for the unwary. Yes, yes. So if you're worried about being trapped as an unwary person, if you're in court with the judge, what, you, what you, should you consider doing? Becoming not unwary, right? <laughs> Trying to get some clarity uh, from the court regarding when are you going to enter this order, is the order entered or not, uh, etc. So you'll know when your appeal rights runs because you got to decide are you going to replead or are you going to appeal, right? Uh, so think about that. Now, and, and then the other thing you should all think about is you want to dismiss, you want to seek a dismissal that would be a dismissal with pre without prejudice. Because what if the statute of limitations is not run? What does that allow the plaintiff to do? Go file somewhere else, right? Let's say if it's, if, if it's a uh, dismissal without prejudice and uh, it's based on some grounds that would allow them to refile, let's say that they dismiss uh, the federal court claims, but there are ancillary state court claims which were not addressed because the federal court claims were dismissed taking away jurisdiction that would allow the plaintiff to go uh, refile somewhere else so you got to look at the long-term and short-term strategy that you have when you're preparing a motion to dismiss uh, so basically for those of you that were in law school less than uh, got out of law school but the last well, more than 10 years ago, my thought is you need to really look at Twombly and Iqbal again whenever you are faced with a complaint, if you're representing the defendant, because, and then also look at how the, district, the circuit courts and district courts have, have parsed various similar complaints to see whether you've got a good grounds for asserting that even if the facts appear to be pled, are they really just conclusions? And if they are pled, or does it lead to a plausible relief? Because you might actually be able to get over the finish line and get the complaint dismissed on behalf of your client, even though you 
historically, under old standards, uh, you might not have been able to do that. So is there anything else anybody wants to discuss before we conclude? Yes, sir. We got I have heard different. through the grapevine, I wasn't there myself, that Judge Ray recently held from the bench that in a case removed from state court to federal court based on diversity, that Iqbal and Twombly do not apply, and instead the Georgia rules of pleading apply to the removed case, which strikes me as 100% incorrect. Okay, do you have any basis for believing it's 100% incorrect? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a matter of procedure. You're in federal court. Okay. Once, it's re once it's removed, federal procedure ought to apply. Okay, but so I, I, anyway, it was just an interesting ruling from the bench, and he's asked both parties to brief the issue. Uh, so for those out there in the world, Judge Razor fairly recently said, uh, confirmed district court judge. So Who was a state court judge? Excuse me, well, he's former, former state court judge. Yeah, he was court appeals judge. Right. So I guess we'll see how uh, that plays out over time. But he gave the parties the opportunity to, to brief yes. the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's good. Julian? I'm sorry. Uh, so Julian had his hands up. Yes, under, under what circumstances uh, will the content of the pleadings, uh, I'm sorry, of the briefs in a motion to dismiss um, for failure to state a claim uh, convert that motion to a motion for summary judgment? Okay, so the question is, just in the event it's not heard, in what circumstances do the briefs and a motion to dismiss potentially convert a motion to dismiss into one for summary judgment? Because that would imply that some sort of evidence has been uh, interjected into the record by way of the motion to dismiss. The motion to dismiss is limited, per, uh, a pure motion to dismiss that's not converted is limited to the defendant's addressing of only those pleadings and matters that have been asserted by the plaintiff and including all attachments and referenced uh, material that is, that is included with the complaint under, is that Rule 10C, I think? Uh, and so uh, we have successfully used that attachment rule in recent history to say, the complaint says this, but the attachment says that, and the attachment is a judge's, is a final order from a judge, so you can ignore everything that's in the complaint because it contradicts what's in the final order from the judge that's attached to the complaint. Uh, and, and so, uh, in that instance, if you're only relying on what's actually in the four corners of the pleading and the reference attachments uh, that are indeed attached, uh, are sent with the complaint, then you're not into summary judgment territory. But if any new evidence is introduced, an affidavit, a uh, reference to some other sort of uh, materials, then that, or even I think, asking for judicial notice by the court, uh, then you can get into summary judgment territory. If, would that, that be a conversion done sui sponte by the judge or this? one of the parties have to move to convert the motion? Uh, the question is, if the court finds that there's additional evidence inserted into the record, can the court sua sponte switch it from a motion to dismiss under Rule 12 to a motion for summary judgment under Rule 56? I believe the court can do it sua sponte by finding, I find that the way this thing played out is additional evidence came into the record. Therefore, I'm uh, converting it to a motion for summary judgment. And of course, sometimes they do that in order to get rid of cases and get rid of them more permanently. Yes? Is there, let, let's say that there's a dismissal without prejudice. Is there any additional steps that have to be taken to make that dismissal sufficiently final for purposes of appeal? Oh, words, a dismissal filed by a judge. I'm sorry? A dismissal filed by the judge without prejudice after a ruling on a motion to dismiss. That's what you're referring to? Right. If Not a voluntary. If, if, it's without, if it's without prejudice, can that be? Is that I, believe that a, I, think, I believe a dismissal without prejudice by a judge is, is appeal, appealable immediately. Okay. If it disposes of the case. If it disposes of the case. Yeah, if, it yeah, if, it, if it's case. a partial motion to dismiss, obviously it wouldn't. That's right. And you don't have any obligation to go uh, uh, try to reignite, reignite the part that was dismissed before you 
excuse me, um, if you're dismissed without prejudice, you don't have to go try again in another court and before you appeal. You have to appeal right then and there because that's the case you have, basically. Um, so I think that wraps it up. Thank you for your time, attention, participation.